Good morning. Good morning. Okay, last class, what did we do? Types. Types. We started doing types, and we did in particular what kind of type language? What do we have in our type language? Numbers, Numbers and? Numbers. Sorry? Closures. Closures, yeah, lambdas, procedures, right? So we had numbers and procedures. So we had arrow types and numeric types. Um, did we talk about conditionals? Yes or no? Anyone remember? <coughs> I think we did, but anyway. Okay, so uh, let's think about what it takes to add conditionals to our language. Okay, so uh, uh, I'm going to start writing my uh, type uh, code a little stylistically rather than doing it as a full blown interpreter, a full blown uh, program. Um, what we're trying to do is basically say some expression E has some type T, right? And we're trying to conclude whether an expression E has type T or not. Now, the problem, of course, is the expression might happen to have uh, free identifiers in it, and those identifiers have hopefully been bound somewhere else, and so we really need to say that, um, you know, some type environment uh, says that E has some type T, right? That's what we're trying to think about. So, this is, of course, going to be generally a conditional statement. It's going to depend on other things being true. For example, if I have an addition statement, right? So if I have an addition of a L plus R, okay, what do we want its type to be? We want its type to be number, okay? So some environment is going to say that uh, L plus R is number. Under what condition is it going to say L plus R is number? When is L plus R of type number? What needs to be true? L and R are both, are both type number. Exactly. In which environment? In the environment in which the function is evaluated? Oh, yes, so, so what, which function? What do you mean the function is evaluated? Plus. That's too big. Yeah, so in whichever environment we're evaluating the plus expression, we want to use the same environment for the two sub-expressions, right? Because plus doesn't change the binding structure. So in the same environment, okay, we want to say that L is of type number, and R is of type number, okay? And if they're both, those things are both true, then we know that the two sub-expressions are both of type number, and the entire uh, sum is also going to be of type number. How does that work with um, things like out-of-bounds exceptions, like if you have int overflow? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, there's potentially going to be some runtime errors as well. We're going to get to that. Uh, I'm, I'm glossing over that for now. I will get to that maybe on Monday, okay? So that's why I'm also dropping division for now. Like for now, we're just going to say division. Oh, division always produces a number, right? But we also have this little side thing, which is, or it might throw an exception. And we'll get to that exception business on Monday. OK? Good. OK, so if I have a function application, I have some environment, and I have function application, f applied to a, well, what do we, what do we need to do? This is really just all I'm doing, by the way, is I'm writing the same recursive program we wrote before, but I'm writing it in a slightly different form. Okay? What did we do when we got to a function application? We needed to? We needed to? Right, so first of all, so first we need to type check the two pieces, right? So we need to type check f, and we need to type check a. We need to check that function is actually a function, right? So from some, you know, T1 to T2, okay? Then what do we need to have be true of A? It not only has to type check, but? You have type one It has to have the same thing that I've written over there, right? So it has to be T1, right? If that is the case, so you remember in the code we wrote this as equal, right? We wrote equal, huh? The, the left-hand side over here with this type over here, if those two are equal, then we go ahead with type checking, otherwise we report an error saying there's a mismatch. Right? So if this is not an arrow, we immediately report an error saying it's not a function. If this is an arrow, but these two don't match up, we report an error. Otherwise, we conclude that the type of the application is T2. T2. Right? <coughs> which environment did we type check F in, and which environment did we type check A in? The same ones, right? So in the same environment. Because at the point of application, you know, the, 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 the function is type checked in that environment, the argument 
The argument gets extended, the environment gets extended with the closure stuff and whatnot inside F, but at the point of application, we're not extending it, right? The application, the pieces F and A, are themselves type checked in the same environment, okay? So finally, we have a rule for uh, lambda. So I have lambda x is of type tau, some body, okay? What do we need to do? What is the only piece we have? What's the only expression we have? Type check B to make sure it's a type T2. Uh, what's T2? The type that F returns. Yeah, so, okay, so let's say B, let's say, so first of all, we have to type check B to make sure that it's not internally inconsistent. Right? That's what type checking does that. So if B, for example, is an addition expression and one side of one of the branches of the addition is a function, then clearly we're going to get a type error. So first we have to type check it to B, make sure it's internally consistent. But remember we talked about the fact that our type checker was actually like, uh, you know, I called it TC because it was also like a type computer, right? It calculates the type. It doesn't just check it, it also calculates it. So when we type check the body, we're going to get some type, some T2 for the body. Right? So what can we conclude about the type of the entire procedure? It's T to T2, right? Except what? Yes? The environment is... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, you have to add uh, to the environment that X is... Exactly. So I've been coy about the whole environment part, right? So I have some environment E over here. What's the environment over here for type checking B? Yes? Same thing plus that. Yeah, so it's extended, right? So I need to say <coughs> that it actually extend, uh, what am I saying? X is bound to T in B, right? In that environment, in that extended environment, if I can type check B, if I can type check it at all, first of all, then the act of type checking will calculate a type for me. I'll call that type T2. And then I can conclude that the entire lambda is of type T to T2. Okay? We're good? Okay. So all I've done, by the way, is in a slightly stylistic way, I've rewritten what we wrote before. So I'm writing our code now in a more sort of uh, uh, sophisticated form because the, uh, you know, like here, for example, the very fact that I write T1 twice means I'm saying those two had better be the same, right? These are called like logic variables in some context, okay? So whatever this thing comes out to be and whatever this thing comes out to be, it's like a pattern match, right? So I'm saying first check that whatever F's type is pattern match it against an arrow, and if it fails to pattern match against an arrow, immediately conclude an error. If it pattern matches against an arrow, call whatever's on the left of the arrow T1, whatever's on the right of the arrow T2, and make sure that that T1 is the same as what you get out over here. Right? And if they're the same, then proceed, otherwise report an error. Otherwise, whatever T2 is over here shows up over here. So it's a very, it's a very concise notation for writing something that took several, several lines of code. Okay? But I want you to start getting used to this notation. I will introduce this notation gradually, because it's going to be a much nicer way of writing uh, type, type, uh, type checkers from now on, right? rather than writing all those lines of code. OK, okay good. So. All I've done now is recap our language, and then of course we have, uh, you know, let's say we have a number, okay? So some environment says that number has type, uh, so any syntactic number has type what? Num. Num. Under what condition does it have the type num? It's always, right? So this is like there's a bar that says what are the conditions above the bar? There are no conditions. Right? It's called an axiom. It's always the case. Right? Numbers always have type num. That's just what they are. We don't argue about that. There's no condition there. Okay? Okay. Now, if we had like more numbers, if we had floats and ints and stuff like that, then we would have, you know, if it's a float kind of number, then it has type float. If it's an int kind of number, it has type int, and then there'd be some conditions there. But right now, there's just nothing. All right. Good? So I don't expect you to have gotten this notation completely into your head. I'm just starting to introduce it because I want to be able to use it later on in the rest of the semester, okay? So I want you to start seeing that this is just a, a clever way of writing the type checker that we wrote before, okay? Sort of using really cool pattern matching, basically, right? Okay. Okay, so we have uh, functions, we have numbers. Let's now do conditionals. So for simplicity, I'm going to say 
we just have an if zero, okay? So you can imagine adding booleans to your language, but uh, just to keep things simple for us, we'll just say that we have an if zero. So if the test position is zero, then it does the true branch, otherwise it does the other false branch. Okay? So if zero, and I have uh, expression one, expression two, and expression three, okay? Expression one is the test expression, expression two is the then, expression three is the else. Well, what do we need to have be true of each of these things? What do we need to have be true of E1? Number. number. It must be a number because? Because it's if zero, right? If we had an if, a generalized if, then we might expect a Boolean there. Now, of course, in some languages, as you full well know, you don't actually expect the if expression to be a Boolean. You allow any value and you say there's like truthy values and falsy values and so on. We'll actually try to return to that topic a little later in about a week or so into semester, okay? So for now, we'll just be more classical and we'll say, look, it has to be one particular type. If zero, the type is number. If it's a generalized if, it's type Boolean, okay? okay. So uh, which environment? Is if zero gonna change environments in any way? It's just a conditional, right? It doesn't mess with environments. If you think about the recursive descent, some end comes in and we use the same end with all the branches, okay? So the environments are uninteresting, right? The only place where environments are interesting is when we type check the body of the lambda. Okay? So environments are uninteresting. So what do we need the type of E1 to be? Well, we've agreed that it needs to be of type num. Okay, so E2, type num? No. Same as E3. Ah, so E2 and E3 don't need to be numbers necessarily. They could be functions, they could be functions from numbers, numbers, they could be booleans, they could be strings, they could be any old type we want. But what is the one thing we are expecting? They have to be consistent. Why do they have to be consistent? Because? Whatever if That's right. Okay, so 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 again, I'm I'm gonna exploit this little pattern matching notation here, which says type check e2, make sure it's internally consistent, <coughs> calculate its type, call it t. Okay? Type check e3, make sure it's internally consistent, calculate its type, and make sure that these are the same type. If you look at the code that's in the book, it has an equal question mark, right? It says check that this type is equal to this type. If it is, then make the whole the type of the whole thing be that type. Okay, so my little pattern matching notation here lets me just write T over here. Okay. So if these two are not of the same type, we have a problem because we don't know what to put over here, right? Because only at runtime do we know which branch is going to execute. In fact, in most programs, both branches will sooner or later execute. And we can't give a type to this expression. Okay. Is that true? Well, almost true, right? It's a function of what your type language is. You could imagine a type language that says, oh, the type is this or that. Okay. Like the union of these two things. And it turns out that such type languages have been built. Uh, they have their uses. Uh, they tend to make life much more complicated. And we will get to them maybe in about six days. Okay. So for now, we'll be, again, in a more classical setting, we assume that both the branches have the same type. Now, in languages like, say, uh, ML, or in the language that you're using PLAI typed, if you really wanted to return two different things here, how do you do that? If it really does make sense, in one case return, say, a string, in another case return a number, how do you do that? Make another type. Yeah. Make another type. You make a new data type, which has two branches, right? And in one case you return one branch, the other case return to the other branch, but they both are the same data type, and that's how you achieve harmony. And then all the receivers have to somehow dispatch and like check which kind of thing they got. They get the string kind of thing or the number kind of thing. Okay? So, so this is essentially a way of shoehorning um, into the idea that there's one type. Or you can say, well, there's multiple types and just push the pain somewhere else. Okay? The, the pain doesn't really go away. The expressiveness just gets moved around a little bit. Okay? And I'll try to talk later on in the semester about these trade-offs a little more. So bottom line, we can assume in a classical setting, we assume that it's the same type we could we can always use data type definitions to achieve the same typeness when we have things that are heterogeneous. We could imagine more complex type systems. We'll hopefully get to that later in the semester. Okay. Good. OK, so we've got conditionals. What's next? Well, we've got functions, and we've got conditionals. We've got if 0, 
So we ought to be able to write something like, uh, like you know, like factorial, right? Recursion. Sorry? Yeah, yeah. So we have to figure out recursion, right? So when we did recursion the first time around, when we did recursion in the untyped setting, do you remember what we did? I know it was ages ago, but do you remember what we did? How do we do recursion in the untyped setting? Anyone? Yeah. Mutation, and in particular, I showed you that we could just do it by desugaring, right? So we, I showed you a little macro, like for recursion, that basically sets up that identifier, actually creates the value, and then mutates the value back in, and says the identifier is all debound, and so you know there's your circular reference. And then when we talked about uh, mutation, we talked about how the same store gets threaded through all things, and that's why the sharing actually really does happen. You really are creating the cyclic thing, the cyclic object. Okay. If you don't remember, we did talk about all of those things. Okay. Um, that was ages ago. So it's natural to ask, why don't we do the same thing again? Right? Now, I haven't yet shown you any rule for mutation in the language, so we can't yet do it that way. So let's ask an even simpler question. If I have just functions, can I write, just forget like, you know, Fibonacci and factorial and stuff. That's complicated, right? Let's just write like an infinite loop, even simpler. Infinite loop. Okay? So exercise. Talk to your classmate. You have just functions. Write an infinite loop. Come on, come on, come on. Okay, so the, this, this, is not a, this is not a fair in class exercise. Okay? <laughs> I just thought it'd be good to like let you stretch your minds a little bit. Um, let's let's start with something really simple. Like, what's the simplest possible function? So clearly, functions are going to have to be involved because if you don't have functions, nothing runs, right? So functions going to be involved. Okay, what's the simplest function you can imagine writing? Identity. Yeah, identity. Good. Okay. So uh, lambda x x, right? Okay. Well, so it just sits there, it doesn't do anything, right? So we have to apply it to something, right? Well, what's the simplest thing we could possibly apply it to? I mean, we could apply it to a number, and then we'll just get the number back out, so that's not going to help us any, right? What else could we apply it to? The identity? Yeah, the simplest function, we'd have to apply it to some kind of function, but the simplest thing is, again, you know, the identity function, right? Okay. So we apply the identity to the identity. What do we get back out? The identity. The identity. Okay. Um, well, what if we? Uh, well, so we got one step of computation. Right. <laughs> okay. well, that's a start. That's a start. What if instead we um, did that? Uh, it is, it is. Uh, yeah, not necessarily, but identity flows in as x, ends up over here and here, so we get identity applied to identity, and that gives us what well, gives us the identity again, right? But notice what we just got. Yes, we got two steps of computation, right? So when we just had the identity applied to itself, we got one step of computation. When we apply the identity to itself, well, this isn't the identity applied to itself anymore, but it's this thing that takes a piece of computation and applies it to itself, and that gives us one extra step of computation. 
right? In fact, this is where the aha comes in, right? If you, this thing is a maker of additional steps of computation, right? It needs to be given something that can make additional steps of computation. What is a maker of additional steps of computation? The thing on the first line, right? So, so what happens now? Well, there's a name for this whole thing. Okay? It's called, you know what that is? A bobblehead, omega, yeah, that's called omega, okay? And these little guys here, they're called, you know what that is? Omega. Yes, omega, yes. <laughs> little omega, capital omega, okay? Right, so here's, a, so it's kind of hard to say, okay, so let's just say little and big, okay? So what happens in big? Big is little applied to little, okay? So little goes in as x, right? And we get little applied to little. But what is little applied to little? Big. big. So we get a copy of big, right? Which when it's applied is little applied to little, so little goes in as x and it becomes little applied to little, which is big, etc., etc. Okay? And there's your infinite loop. Okay, so we have an infinite loop. Great. Just with functions. Um, okay, now we have to apply type, give it types. Go for it. You have all, there's no numbers, there's nothing else. There's just functions, okay? Talk to your neighbor. So here's our goal. You observe that if we can type one of the little omegas, we can type the whole thing, right? Because it's just two copies, we're gonna write it twice, okay? So our goal is, fill in the hole here, and fill in the hole here, such that this has a type. Go, talk to your neighbors, come on, come on. So you know X is gonna you can use I mean you can use inference to figure out that <laughs> So X can be a number. Work it out for yourself. No, 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 I get it. Okay, good. X can be a number of things we know it's a function. And you know that it takes X as R. It's true. So it's. <laughs> What's the expression? Dude, you need a piece of paper. Oh. <laughs> oh. I mean, it's like something. You know, and then it returns this, right? Because you're applying. Anyone want more time? But like, this is just going to be like an infinite. Uh, <laughs> I love it. They're just soldiering on. It's awesome. <laughs> okay, here's the problem. You're going to need a lot more time. <laughs> here's what's going on. Let's just say this is some t1 and t2. Okay. So the type of little omega is some t1 to t2, okay? For t1 and t2 to be determined, <laughs> okay? Now, so what? What can we conclude from that? Well, we're done. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, there we go, we're done, it's t1 to t2. <laughs> Amazing, nobody thought of that before. <laughs> uh, so, what happens to x? x is used as a function, right, over here. So x must in turn be a function to t2, right? Okay, what is the argument being passed in? It's, it's the type of omega, right? So it's what? It's basically itself. 
This is the problem with the self-application. It's taking itself as an argument, so its argument must be itself. So we actually get a recursive equation that says t1 equals t1 to t2, right? So it's, this, it's actually not a type you can even write down in the type language that you have. Because the only type you can write that, that would actually satisfy this equation, because it has no base case, right? It's a recursive function with no base case, so the only type you can write would have to be infinitely long. Okay? Since we have finite computers, uh, you know, like even I think your Macintoshes, I'm pretty sure, are finite computers, so you cannot write down this infinitely long type because it's not a finite string. Okay? So there's no type. Now, you could ask a question, is there a type language in which I could write that type? And the answer is yes, and maybe we'll get to that later this semester. But for now, in the type language we have, so this is a critical thing, in the type language we have, this type is not expressible. Now, I've actually made a little leap of faith there. Right? I've just said it is not expressible. There needs to be a proof of that statement, and I haven't given you anything resembling a proof. I've just sort of uh, stood here and authoritatively made this claim. But it turns out there is such a proof, and we're not going to get to it in this course, but there is a proof that you cannot write down a type for this thing. Okay? There's actually an even stronger statement we can make. Turns out, in the type language we have, um, there's a name for this. This is called the STLC, which stands for the Simply Typed Lambda Calculus, but that's just a big word. Okay? But in this language that we have, you can't write down any infinite loops. There are no infinite loops you can write down. Any attempt to write down an infinite loop will be blocked by the type system. Yes? So does that mean if you can write it down, then so if you can write it down, if you can write down a program that truly will evaluate forever, you must have violated the grammar of the language in some way. For example, you must have written, either you gave the wrong types, right? Uh, in which case the type checker would have caught it, I guess. Or you've written a type that's not actually in the type language we have so far. You've used some feature of the type system that's not actually in the language. And your parser is broken and didn't prevent you from writing the program down. Okay? You cannot. You really, literally cannot. Okay? This is a very, very strong theorem. This is a property and I know we're in the realm of big words here. It's called strong normalization and the term comes from the fact that normalization is an old name given for evaluation. Basically, you, do, you, you have a set of terms and you define a subset of those terms as things from which you cannot do additional reductions and those are called normal forms. So normalization is the act, from go, act of going from a complex term down to a normal form. And strong normalization is saying, sort of no matter which way you try to do it, you'll still end up at a normal form. Okay? So there's a, there's a sophisticated way of saying, and there's a reason for the sophistication that we're not talking about in this class because it's not a theory course. But there's a sophisticated way of saying, no matter how you try to evaluate this, no matter what you do, in a finite number of steps, you will get to an answer. This is weird. Okay? What we've done is, we, we, we used to think of recursion as just a little desugaring, right? It was a macro, and we even showed how to write it in like a five-line macro. But now we've suddenly gotten to a language where because it is typed, it's all because it's typed. If it weren't typed, this isn't an issue at all. It's the type system that prevents us from writing down a type. And so our typing has suddenly completely altered the semantics of the language. This is an important point. You're used to type checking as being, oh, it's just, I'll just run this thing, it'll catch a few stupid errors that I made, and then I just, you know, and then the programs are more or less the same things that I would have run anyway. I mean, in fact, they're just, you know, these are errors that would have occurred at runtime anyway, and my static type checker just caught them. So it's, you know, all it is is a convenience, and maybe there's even a bit of a trade-off there, right? But now we've just seen something really profound. We didn't just block a few runtime errors that would have happened anyway. We've completely changed the nature of our programming language by making it impossible to write a whole bunch of programs that we were able to write until now. So in that sense, types are actually a semantic property of the language. Okay? What type system you impose on the language really does at some profound level change what the semantic properties are of the language. And in one or two classes, we'll talk more about sort of these kinds of theorems about that we get out of types and about type systems. Okay. So this is a really powerful feature. It says that the language, no matter what program you write, 
If you were able to type check this program, it is guaranteed to not run forever. Okay? And if you want a very rough intuition, this isn't a proof, but a very rough intuition, the way to think about it is um, essentially, I have these arrow types, right? And every time I do an application, I get rid of an arrow, right? I discharge an arrow. And I can write down only a finite number of them. And so if every application gets rid of an arrow, then eventually I kind of run out of arrows, right? It's like the Robin Hood nightmare scenario, right? So that, that's, that's, that's a very loose intuition. Don't, don't get too caught up on the intuition because we'll soon see that it's possible to have a finite number of arrows in your program and still actually get recursion, okay? But, but that's just a sort of inkling of what's going on. It's like every time you discharge one of these things, and then pretty soon you run out of things to discharge, and that's why you, your program has no choice. It's gotten to an answer, and it has to stop. Okay. okay. So, now I've shown you this language. Um, obviously, this is not a happy state of affairs. We'd like to be able to write, you know, like Fibonacci, right? Everyone's most important recursive program. So, so we want to be able to write, you know, Fibonacci and factorial and things like that, um, and other important programs. So what use is this? This is like a stupid property, right? This is the dumbest language in the world. A programming language where you can't write infinite loops. Because all the, I mean, all of the world's an infinite loop, right? Your operating system. Is the operating system a terminating program? Of course not. You don't want your operating system to terminate. Your traffic light controller. You want your traffic light controller to terminate? Of course not. You want your vending machine to terminate? All important vending machine on the first floor? Of course not. You don't want any of these programs in the world. Your watch? Do you want your watch to terminate? Would you like your car to terminate as you're driving along? No, you don't want any of these programs to terminate. The world is full of infinite loops. So this is a completely useless language, right? Right? Yes. <laughs> right? We can't possibly have any use for a programming language where all programs terminate, can we? Teaching language. Couldn't possibly. Huh? Like, that's not yeah, like what? I mean, are there any places where you'll write programs that you absolutely want to be sure they terminate? Is there any program that you use in your daily life that you want to be guaranteed will not go into an infinite loop. Yeah. A compiler. A compiler? I mean, the program that it compiles may run forever, like your operating system, but you don't want the compiler to go into an infinite loop. Turns out that's kind of a classical notion these days, compilers do. But, but you know, you don't want your compiler to go into an infinite loop. You don't willfully make it go into an infinite loop. What else do you not want to have go into an infinite loop? Something on the web. Something on the web? Well, certainly in your JavaScript programs, you want all of those handlers, right? Because if you're single-threadedness of JavaScript, you want every JavaScript handler to terminate because it has to return control to the, to the single, single line of control that's inside the browser. What else do you want to have be guaranteed to terminate? Calculator. Sorry? Calculator. A calculator, but think, a linker, right? You want the linking process to construct your program and guarantee to construct your program. Think about a packet filter, right? Inside your router. Think about, so I said your operating system is an infinite loop, but it's an infinite loop of lots of little finite pieces of execution, right? What does the operating system do? It picks a thread, it runs it, comes back, picks another thread, runs it, picks another thread. So what's going on underneath the operating system is a? Terminating program. Uh, yeah, a scheduler, right? We even wrote one in class. And that scheduler, had better terminate. It better terminate really fast, as a matter of fact. But you sure as heck want that scheduler to terminate. You want it to pick the next thread and guarantee to pick a next thread. You don't want your scheduler to go off into an infinite loop. Right? So there's actually many, many situations, even in these non-terminating programs, where they're non-terminating over lots of little pieces of computation, these subcomputations, that really must terminate. It's a very strange structure. Right? So you have this program that runs forever but it has all these little things that have to terminate quickly. Right? And a lot of real world code is like this. A lot of embedded systems are like this. They run forever, but inside them is little pieces of computation that terminate, 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 and it's that composition that fails to terminate. Okay? That's the structure of real world software. So you would really benefit from having a language in which no matter what program you wrote, that thing is guaranteed to terminate. And this is not an entirely hypothetical thing. People have tried, talked, done this sort of thing for uh, 
uh, like active networks where you actually put code inside the network. So as packets are being routed around, you want to make sure that they terminate, and so you know you use this idea. Another place where this idea is used is in the linking language for ML. So in ML, you have modules, and modules are at a very loose level. They, you can think of them as kind of functions. That these things called functors, which take one module as an input and construct a bigger module out of the corresponding things that they got. Right. So they're kind of functions on modules. So that's the process of linking. What is linking, right? I mean, you do linking in C, and you think of it as like glomming bits together. But really, what you're doing is you're taking some piece of code that was parameterized over some inputs, right, which are the libraries, and you actually feed those libraries, and you compose those. You can think of that as a function over its libraries. You give it its libraries, and you perform function composition. That's really what linking is. It's just kind of obscured by the syntax and the way you do it in C. Okay? Now, if you think of it that way, well, your linking language would be really nice if it had functions. Well, if you have functions, you might as well have higher order functions, right? You might as well go the whole hog. So what I've now given you is a language where you can actually have higher order functions, honest to goodness functions as values, right? But you're still guaranteed that no matter what program you write, it terminates. So the type system of the linking language is actually the type system we've seen in, in certain versions of ML. It uses this idea to guarantee that you can get a very rich expressive language for writing your linking program, but for, for writing the linker, linkage of a particular piece of modules, collection of modules, but it's still guaranteed that the linker will always terminate and you'll get a program that can run. There are lots of uses for this idea. Okay? So when you go out and start building embedded systems and building things that have termination issues, Think hard, do I want this to terminate? And if you do want it to always terminate, it's cool to have a language that guarantees it'll never not terminate. No matter what program you write, right? That's great, you don't have to think about it anymore. If you can write your program in this language, problem solved. Okay, make sense? Good. But, now let's get back to down termination. Okay, so last time when we, de when we dealt with recursion, we added this little rec construct for giving ourselves recursive programs, we said, look, we can just do this through desugaring. Now it's clear we can no longer do it through desugaring. We have to actually build it, we have to bake it into our language. Okay? So let's do it by writing a rule for rec. Okay, so I have some environment. And the notation we use, by the way, is, uh, you know, I've sort of been saying says or leaving it blank. We use a little turnstile here. Okay? And the way to read turnstile is proofs. We read colon pass. Okay. So this environment proves that this expression has type T. So if you have something that's just like an axiomatic number, then any environment proves that a number has type num. Okay? But in more complex settings, that you need an environment, and there could be a set of environments that do that, but you need an environment that actually does that. So, we'll use this notation from now on. So I have an environment, and what does my rec construct look like? Well, I've got the name of some function, okay? and it has, uh, it has an argument of some type, and it returns some type. Okay? And I have the body of my function, and finally I have some expression in which I use the function. So f is the name that's going to be bound inside b. It's a function of one argument a. The return type of that is going to be r. Okay? So that's the return type and the argument type. And b can refer to f recursively. And u can also refer to f. And so, this, so for example, I might write uh, um, rec um, fact of uh, n is a num, it returns a number, and in the body, what am I going to say? I'm going to say if 0 uh, n, then I return 1, otherwise I return multiply n by fact of minus n1, and then in the body, I say maybe fact of 10, say. Okay. Good. Okay, what do we need to do to type check this 
rec. Talk to your neighbors. But you're going first. <laughs> Talk to your neighbors. Come on. What are all the things we need to type check and what do you need those types to be? Think about your environments as well. The only thing I have to Okay, should we talk about it or one more time? Once more time. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, good. Okay. All right. Here's the way to proceed methodically. First of all, what are we type checking? Are we type checking binding instances of identifiers? Are we type checking the word rec? We're not interested in any of those, right? We're only interested in type checking. We remember what the type of TC was? TC took as its argument, first argument? Expressions. We're only interested in type checking expressions. How many expressions do we have here? Two. 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 Which ones? B and U. Okay? So we need to conclude something about U, or we need to conclude something about B. Right? And if we conclude something about each of those, then we should be good. Okay. What do we want to conclude about B? What would we like to have be true about B? Yeah, so B's type needs to be, in fact, I'm going to write this even further over to the right. Okay. It better be the same thing as this thing over here. Right? Yeah, so, so just say, in environment E, we're type checking rec. That's what we're, that's, read, that, read it that way, okay? Okay, so this had better be RT, right? So this is saying that this expression, if 0, return 1, otherwise return sum, had better be the same as num. OK? Yes? So is RT um, specified when you're actually writing the program? Yes, exactly. It's all explicit. OK? We're not doing any inference yet. We'll get to inference in two weeks. OK? So I've written very explicitly colon num here. So we're going to type check that it better be the same. And if it, there's a mismatch between this and this, then you report a type error saying one of the others wrong. Okay? I mean, in fact, you know this is the truth, right? It's whatever B's type is going to be, and then the spec is wrong. Or you could argue the spec is correct and B is wrong. Yeah. Okay. okay, good? That much clear? Okay. What do we want to, want to conclude about the type of U? What does it have to be? Could be anything, right? I mean, this is just some body that could use fact and do all sorts of other things inside the body. So we're not, con we're not forcing it to be constrained to be anything over here. So it's any old type we want, okay? And that's what the type of the whole expression is going to be, okay? It's the result of running u, okay? Good. Okay, so I've left wide open spaces here, right? This huge prairie of line of space here. 
So clearly we're going to have to do this in some extended environments. Right? How are we extending E for type checking U? So we extend E with what? What names are bound? How many names are here first of all? Which ones? F and? And A. In U, which of these names is bound? F. Is U bound? No, because it's the private variable for this function over here, right? We don't want to bind it in the body. Okay. So we want to extend F, extend E, with F bound to what? With? Right. F is a function from AT to RT. Okay? So F claims to be a function from AT to RT. We're going to take that claim on face value for now. We're going to extend the environment E with that binding, and then we go to type check U. Okay? And if that works out, then at least we know that we've used F in a consistent way inside U, and that's good. But what else do we need to check? Sorry? Used in B. Yeah, we need to check that, in fact, not just that it's used in, so it could be used in or, B. I mean, it's but, used in B is the right type. That's right, that's right. But also just that B is sort of constructed in such a way that F is the right type, right? It sort of goes both ways. Okay? So, we need to extend U, extend E, with how many bindings when we type check B? Which things can be bound? Both F and A, right? Okay, what do we extend it with? Well, what's the type of F? Same. Well, it better be the same, right? It doesn't change its type miraculously halfway through. So it's uh, AT to RT. Okay. And what are we extending uh, the type of uh, A to B? AT. Type of A is AT. Okay. So we extend E with F bound to AT to RT and A bound to AT, which is the declared type. And now what we're doing is we're checking that B is sort of internally consistent. And if, notice what's happening. If this type checking succeeds, so if B is found to have type RT, then that means that the function F we've defined, when given things of type ATs, really does produce things of type RT, right? The because the body is the thing that produces that answer, the body really does produce RTs when given ATs. Therefore, it is safe to conclude that F really is a function from ATs to RTs. And that's what tells us that using F over here as AT to RT is OK. But because it's a rec, we can actually use F as AT to RT inside its body as well. Yes? If this type checking isn't going to trust the user and it's going to run through the body of all the functions anyway, what's the point of actually type casting our functions? Uh, what do you mean by type casting? Um, by <coughs> specifying return type, I guess. OK, I'd rather not use the word casting because it means something different. Okay. But why are we writing, writing the return types? So in fact, in many cases, you can actually skip writing the return types, OK? Because we calculate anyway what the return types are. I'm just being completely explicit, and we'll slowly, you know, so, so not writing. We're actually already doing a tiny, tiny bit of inference, right? And in that for a given expression, we don't say three colon number, right? Plus one, two, where plus one colon number, two colon number, whole thing colon number. We don't do that, right? So we only calculate the types of sub-expressions. So it's kind of an inference in a very, very you know, easy sense. So we could also calculate out these types, but it turns out that we're not going to be able to shed all of the type declarations. So I'll get to inference as a whole separate topic, and then we can show how we can drop almost all of the annotations. Okay. So for now, we'll just stay in a language where everything's explicitly I mean, look, you get programming Java, you're used to this all the time anyway, so we're complaining about it. Okay, so why does this give us an infinite loop, by the way? What's going on here? <coughs> what gives us the infinite loop here? Why is this language enabling us to write an infinite loop, whereas the previous language did not? Because it's a returning number, not a function. Sorry? It's a returning a number, not a function. That the type is not the type's not infinite at all. No, no, no. The types are not infinite. So what's letting me write an infinite loop? F is bound with the Sorry? F is bound within F. F is bound to F within F. F is bound to F within F. It's this thing right here, right? It's this binding over here that says that whenever I need another copy of F, it's always available in its environment. Right? So in some sense, this thing here is the thing that ties the loop. It's the thing that gives me uh, my, my sort of quiver of infinite arrows, if you will. Right? 
So I write only a finite number in my source program, but because it's bound within itself, it's like implicitly constructing that self loop over there. Okay? Good. Questions? So what have we done? We did conditionals, then we got to recursion. We showed that we couldn't actually write anything recursive. We couldn't write infinite loops. We couldn't write anything that might not terminate. We've talked about the strong property that gives, and then we talked about what it takes to actually add recursion as an explicit construct. We can no longer do it through desugaring. We have to actually add it to the core type language. Okay? Get on to more things next class. Thank you. So it seems to be that just like